Hi, and thanks for having me back again. I really appreciate it. In this talk, I'm going to be getting a bit more into the language of systems. And particularly, we're going to be talking about two really important factors, this idea of stocks, uh, which is kind of like a reservoir or a, an amount of something that we have, and then flows. And this really gets to the input and output of how much stuff is flowing throughout our system. So the question is, what are stocks? What are flows? That'll guide us through the conversation. And then how are they used in this idea of the language of systems? And we'll be introducing some um, scales and images, models, if you will, that'll help to articulate what that really means. Okay, so the language of systems. Um, as you go about trying to take concepts of, say, the circular economy, or even simple structures or complex structures, you can't do what I'm doing and just talk to people at length about it. You actually need to give them some visual representation of how a stock actually wants to flow throughout a system. And so, um, what we'll do is we'll get into this idea of conceptualizing systems with arrows. It's some of the really basic models that, we'll, that um, you may have encountered in the past. Um, and you also will get an idea, I, this idea of polarizing signs. For instance, is there a positive or negative influence, depending on how a flow wants to go. Um, these we, we call causal loop diagrams, and I'll get into that in, in the next slide. So. Um, what we want to do is this idea of the preservation, if you will, of stuff within a system. And so I'm going to start this idea of a bathtub, something that most of us hopefully are familiar with, uh, and what needs to go into it and what needs to go out of it. So if you look at this little diagram here, we have this idea of a bathtub. So we have the system in place. We'll start with the bathtub being one, simple, very simple. Uh, the stock is the stuff that we actually want. In this case, it's water. We, the whole reason why we have a bathtub is to retain and hold water. The inflow is the water coming from the faucet. And you know, there's, there's dark, there are dynamics to that. For instance, how wide the faucet is, how much water pressure there is, how fast the water comes out. So that dictates our inflow. And then there's our outflow is the drain, water leaving the bathtub. And even that has different parameters. Is how wide or how narrow it is? Is it clogged? Is it free? Um, you know, that will dictate the speed of how much water leaves the system. This idea goes to other things that we're probably familiar with. Your, your bank account, if you have one, uh, is another example. You know, you, the whole reason why you have a bank account is that it holds your money, if you have some. Um, you know, you check your balance online or you go to the bank and you get a statement. You put money in. So you work and you earn money and then you put money into your bank account and then it sits there for when you need it. And that's when you need it is when you can withdraw from it. You know, when you get a, go get a paycheck and get it cashed, you know, all that money doesn't go straight into your pocket. Well, maybe for some of you, I'm not going to pass any judgment, but you know, we don't want it in our pocket. We want to put it somewhere else where it's safer and can just kind of sit and chill and we can take it when we need it. Uh, stores and their inventory do the exact same thing or even customers in the store. So the stock is that store owners want customers in their store. And so you measure by people coming into the store and you can attract people by sales or whatever it is that you're selling. And then there's people leaving the store, you know, are people sticking around a long time? Are they in and out? Um, you know, or is inventory against the same thing? How much is in your store versus how much is leaving your store? Uh, and the national budget, again, what is of massive conversation in politics all of the time is at least in the United States sense is how much debt do we have, for instance, as opposed to say surplus. Uh, and of course, revenue generated, say via taxes, um, or borrowing from other countries, and then how much we spend on government services. So stocks are everywhere, and how we go about them are everywhere too. Okay, so really simple. Um, how much is in, say, the bathtub? Well, you know, we basically have correlations. If the inflow, how much is going in, is greater than the outflow, then you'll see a nice progression over time. So we'll give ourselves some axes here. And so, you know, is there a limit? So if you look at the kind of the uh, ruler here, that there is a rim, there is a certain amount that the bathtub can hold. So maybe we have ourselves a carrying capacity, if you will, of positive correlation. You know, are we going to meet, stay below, or surpass the capacity of our stock. 
You know, perhaps maybe your goal is to have a constant balance of your stock and to maintain it over time. So maybe you're never getting above carrying capacity here, or you have too much of something. And that's something that you have, uh, maybe if you're trying to lose weight, for instance, um, you know, you have only so much weight that your body can healthily carry, and maybe you are overweight, and then you exercise and get good diet and so forth, and then you lose weight, and then maybe you level out. So you have yourselves a positive correlation, a neutral correlation, and then a negative correlation. Pretty simple. So depending on the amount and the behavior that you have is going to dictate how it is that you manipulate the stock of your system. Okay, so <clears throat> this idea of stock and flow diagrams, these are really bare bones ideas of what we call causal loop diagrams. Uh, what these do is that they help to uh, emphasize the feedback structure of the different systems that we're playing with. And again, if you remember what feedback systems are, we have both uh, reinforcing feedback loops, which furthers a particular behavior taking place, or we have balancing feedback loops, which helps to kind of neutralize and maintain a certain behavior. So it's either adding or maintaining. And even when we say reinforcing feedback loop, that could be driving in a particular direction or driving in a negative direction. So it's basically just going into any given direction. So um, if we look at this causal loop diagram here, um, what we see is a couple of things I want to point out. I'm going to use population as the primary driver of this conversation here. So if population is here, um, you know, if there's more population, then it's reasonable that we'll see more births. And so as you uh, see the direction of influence, so the arrow is critical. So if you follow the arrow, and we always signify that by the little end of the arrow head at the end of the arrow, you see that's the direction of influence. So as population goes up, so does births. And if we look flip side here, another causal loop, if there are more births, then we can assume that there's more population. Okay, so more births, so means more people, which increases the population, and that means there's more people having babies, and that we'll call a, a reinforcing feedback loop. But what's nice is that we also have this mechanism to try and balance things out. So if there's more people, um, then there's going to be more deaths, which is, that itself is a positive feedback loop. So if population goes up, deaths goes up, okay. But then the actual behavior of deaths, what that does is that helps to balance the population. So as population goes up, deaths goes up. If deaths goes up, population goes down. So that's that direction, if you will, is a balancing feedback loop. So quick recap, population goes up, births go up. If births go up, population goes up. <laughs> if population goes up, deaths go up. If deaths goes up, Population goes down. It's a wonderful balancing, wonderful feedback loop. Wahoo. And here's a, a, a trick. If, say, these causal feedback loops get out of control, um, count the number of negative signs. No, that's a positive, sorry. Count the number of negative signs. Um, if it's odd, then all of the system is balancing. If they're even, and the whole system will be reinforcing its overall behavior. And hopefully that will help to dictate where you want to intervene in a system. Okay, so if that's causal loop diagrams. The other system we want to play with now is this idea of stock and flow diagrams to emphasize physical structure. So if causal loops are doing feedback loops, stock and flows are underlying physical structures. And here are some of the, the different dynamics at play. Okay, so we have um, stocks. Whenever we do diagramming, the stuff that we're trying to preserve, we typically just do this rectangle business here. That tells us, okay, we have now entered a, a reservoir of some type, some sort of basin that's gonna hold the stuff that we're trying to manipulate. And so for the idea of, say, a circular economy, um, slowing down the input and output and recycling, if you will, into this stock system is going to be critical for you to manage whatever material or capacity of something uh, of a service you're trying to do uh, for the system that you're trying to work within. So sticking with population, uh, we have births here. 
so actually, so you see this kind of cloud looking thing here. This is means outside of our system. So um, there are those other dynamics that we don't have control over. And that's okay. Every system's got them. So for whatever reason, births start to increase. Uh, this little hourglass looking thing here helps the idea of the different agent at play. Births uh, enter the population. The stock of people goes up. But then also deaths are at play, which is what causes this outflow here. And then deaths of people leave the population system. It's just this. So well, the facts of life. Um, and the inflow outflow of people, of what makes a population, is what dictates how grand, big, or small our stock is. Now what's critical, and what we'll get into the idea next, is that it's how much of these inflows or outflows are at play. And to have them is one thing, but then to allow their behavior to unfold is a whole other thing. Okay, so this one, I can do a little bit of math. Um, we get this idea of auxiliary variables. And so the variables are what dictate the behavior. So for instance, in our birth rate here, um, I pulled these numbers not too long ago. Uh, right now, you know, for every thousand people in the United States, we have about 12 and a half births, which basically equates to a little under two children per woman. Um, the death rate right now uh, is about 8.2 per thousand people. So, whereas you have, so that tells us 12.5 per thousand of people getting born, and then 8.2 per thousand people dying. What does that tell us? That tells us that our births are greater than our deaths. Hmm. So with that. Um, but there, of course, there are other dynamics at play. This is really basic. Like, you know, you, you could talk about economic structures, you could talk about health, you could talk about accidents taking place. So all those are at play in this. And also I included down here the migrant rate, which is people from other, other countries into our country. Um, you know, there are so many more variables at play, these auxiliary variables. I understand that. We're just gonna go with birth rate and death rate. So for our purposes, um, if say we have a million people in our stock, all right? So we'll start with that. Uh, and basically we'll call that P since it starts with population. So population equals a million. What you can really do here is as you start to think about your inflow and outflow is look at these kind of these variables. So if population is this, what we'll do is then we'll add our population times the birth rate. All right. And then you get that total, or and then you minus the population and the death rate, what we'll call D here. And then as those, as your current existing stock, and then as your inputs adjust, inf increase, and then as your outflow decreases or balances or maintains, you'll then essentially have P1, this new amount. Understand that the second, or this uh, end P, if you will, is always gonna be changing depending on how high or how low these auxiliary variable variables are. But if you have the idea of having kind of like real-time equation uh, output, it'll help to give you a better idea to manage the stock. And so uh, really basic uh, things, but it's, it's all about how fast or how slow things are coming and going. Okay, so the goal, the goal is to keep the flow easy, easily understood and if you're trying to invite people into the process of stock management, as in like how much of something we should have, these, these diagrams, causal loop and stock and flow, the, the simple understanding of the, the variables at play and the things that just are, uh, is critical to invite people into the conversation. And so um, the amount of stuff that we have 
and this is, might be a bit more difficult for some folks to get, is that they play a central role in dynamic feedback problems. Um, too much of something is not a good thing, and too little of something is not a good thing. Every single system wants to have that nice sweet spot, like Goldilocks style, of just having the right amount. And you know, this is the kind of pursuit that uh, a lot of systems have. You know, like for instance, you know, greed is, for instance, frowned upon. Um, you don't want to be too hungry and having too little food. You know, you want to always have that nice balance. And so, that idea of too much, too little is what gives systems a lot of problems. It's also the foundation of any system, is the stuff that the system's trying to move through. You know, you are you, for instance, your personality is interesting and dynamic, but without food and without water, your personality doesn't mean anything anymore because your system needs those things. And so your body doesn't exist just to have conversations per se, but it's actually dependent upon the exchange of food and even in ecosystems, if you will. Um, whole species are dependent upon bodies consuming and leaving droppings to spread their seed, to move nutrients around. And so it's interesting how much stuff dictates systems. In this instance, you could almost say that consumerism is a good thing, if you will, because it's just consum consuming and managing stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> the memory of history changing the flows in the system. A great example of this uh, would be, for instance, spending, for instance. You know, if you have a lot of money and you're used to spending a lot of money and all of a sudden all that money goes away, it can be really hard to break that habit. Or, you know, if you're trying to lose weight, but you're really used to drinking soda and candy, that sort of thing, it can be really hard to lose that behavior. Not to mention your body becomes accustomed to all that weight, the extra stuff you're carrying. Or flip side, it can be really accustomed to being thin and then if you start weightlifting and gaining a lot of muscle, it might be hard for your body, the system, to adjust to those changes. And so, um, you know, same thing with, for instance, agriculture, having a lot of water available, uh, urban development and planning and community systems in urban settings. Or, for instance, in the circular economy, when you have traditional industries that are very accustomed to just getting materials, processing them, waste is not a concern, and getting products to market, if you start changing and readapting how materials get to manufacturers, there's a lot of not just behavioral and institutional history, but then you have all the infrastructure at place that's totally dependent upon processing things, receiving things immediately, processing things immediately, and getting things out immediately. So you have a lot of memory, if you will, you, you would call that, that dictates how fast or slow things can change in the system. Control is often the primary goal. And so this is why, for instance, in the Phoenix metropolitan area, um, you know, we have many reservoirs uphill and to the east of the city. We have a couple rivers that we are dependent upon, but we don't just like run a straw from the river and bring it to our sinks. Like what happens when we have a week, a month and a half of no rain? You know, we need to create stocks, these reservoirs to ensure that we have consistent supply to draw upon when we want it. This is why we don't put our paychecks and all of our cash in our pockets because the security and safety of it can go. We have bank accounts, so we, we know that the re resource we want, we can take from it when we want it. Control is the goal. You know, you don't, you know, I don't know if you have any friends, for instance, that always go out to eat and have zero food in their house. You know, we have refrigerators and pantries to store food when we want it. We don't want all of it all at once but we want to have it easily accessible. Cash and reserves in our banks, sugar in our blood, don't want to get hangry. Um, you know, we want to make sure these things are available to us when we want them, and that is control. So we don't only control these variables, but we also use their values as basis for action in managing other variables. <clears throat> and so what we're saying here is that knowing that we have a particular stock at our disposal will then dictate how we start to influence, say, decision making. You know, if we're constantly talking about drought and lack of water, that's gonna really impact agriculture, that's gonna impact urban development, that's gonna impact 
communities downriver, for instance, you know, and then we have to have conversations with uh, from different municipalities. And so based on how much or how little we have something is going to start dictating our decisions about other things. And this is the idea where interconnectivity can really be important, you know, not looking at a stock in isolation, but looking at the stock availability and its consequences to other variables that maybe we didn't think about before until the behavior of the stock was too much or too little. So that's why control and reliability of the stock is critical. So uh, controlling stocks is subtle and dynamically complex by its very nature. You don't know when, for instance, if you're, if you're a water manager, you don't know when you're gonna have a flood. You're not gonna know when you're gonna have a drought. Um, you know, there's a, a nuance to be able to control how much of something you have access to. Um, you know, if you're saving for something or if you're going on a spending spree, um, <clears throat> it's really, really difficult to have absolute control. But having that basin gives you a bit more control. You're not going to have absolute control. You will never have absolute control. Uh, but by creating yourself a little stockpile, if you will, of whatever resource you're trying to have um, access to, gives you time. And time might be the most precious thing, if you will, besides the stock. But time itself might be another precious stock, if you will, that you can't afford yourself. Okay. And with that, it uh, eliminates having to immediately meet demand of the stock. It adds flexibility to the supply. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, you don't need to just constantly have things on demand. That's the idea of time. Kind of already expanded upon that one. Okay, um, so thinking about stocks, this is, and this is the, the, what I want to get to in terms of like the human nature of things. People tend to think about inflows more than they think about outflows. Um, you know, I think right now, energy, for instance, is a wonderful conversation that gets to this. So much of the conversation is how, where do we get energy from? You know, do we get it from renewables? Do we go into coal reserves? Do we build new oil rigs out in, in the Gulf of Mexico? You know, it's energy generation is essentially input to our electrical system. One thing that has a, needs to probably get more, at least, conversation is energy efficiency. You know, it's not as, you know, recycled newspaper and denim getting blown into your attics or into your sidewalls is not an, as much of an attractive conversation as, say, putting solar panels on your roof. Uh, but, you know, is it maybe... If your house is only 30 or 40 percent efficient, which is like heinously low, um, you know, why, maybe it's more apt that we get that efficiency up, so closing your output, as opposed to worrying about, um, you know, how much energy you're buying. You know, it, it's, think about your house, if you will, as a stock in terms of energy consumption. Um, and a weather stripping, for instance, around your windows and doors is not the most like, fun, interesting conversation, but literally going to your hardware store and getting $5 a little sticky roll tape can really be a big difference as opposed to say, say spending more uh, on your energy bill to meet whatever temperature demand you have in your house or all the appliances that you want to run. Um, so one thing to be aware of is this idea of flow bias. Yes, flow bias. Watch out. Um, when you think about things on a community and economic scale, and this is really critical for the circular economy, is this idea of who benefits and who profits from where your stock comes from. Think about that. You know, do you pay less for, say, home efficiency or car efficiency? Or do you want to give that money to, say, oil companies for more oil production? So if you really dig your pickup truck or your SUV or something that's a bit more fuel consumptive, you know, maybe then there are fuel companies that stand to benefit from that, from that. Or versus if you get a hybrid or an electric vehicle, you know, oil companies do not stand to benefit from that. So this idea of flow bias, are those who provide the inflow dictating the behavior of the stock? Or as you as a consumer, do you have influence on maybe constricting the outflow 
so that you're no longer as dependent on the inflow. And it gives you greater power of the stock. And when you have greater power of the stock, you have greater control of the system. So bias from those who provide the inflow, being re recognizing that and identifying it is critical. So when we think about the circular economy, if we get away from linear processes where we're always cramming stuff into the system and people benefit and make money or organizations benefit from making money on pushing things through the linear system and getting it out of the system to keep feeding it through, stocks, if you will, slowing down that can create tension on this end. But if you're spending resources to do this or maintain this, that's up to you on how you want to dictate inflow and outflow. Okay, so stocks, they are essentially buffers. Uh, stocks typically change slowly, and they do that by design. Um, even if the inflow or the outflow, one of these, change suddenly, this remains fairly static. I mean, it will change over time, but it helps as a nice breathing point in the system. You know, you know when, you, when you come across that rectangle in the stock and flow diagram, take a breath. Know that you're going to be there for a little bit, okay? This means that stocks can act as a delay or buffer in a system. Uh, think of it as like a shock absorber to the system. So if we have floods or drought, I'm going back to the idea of reservoirs. Um, and what you see here, the picture here is uh, Lake Roosevelt, which is the largest reservoir east of Phoenix. It's the majority of where our water is stored. Um, <clears throat> you know, even in times of drought, we know that there's gonna be water available because we've created that stock reservoir to maintain our water. Uh, but of course, if you've been to the Southwest and say, you know, you've seen major lakes, you see that bathtub ring slowly form over time, say times of drought or over withdrawal. And so that kind of gives you a little bit of alarm to say, okay, our stock is starting to deplete, but hey, maybe after winter rains in the desert, that starts to build back up again reducing some of those concerns because having more of our stock is reassuring. But that also can backfire in such a way. For instance, if we get out of the water and go into the air, our atmosphere is holding a lot of carbon right now, for instance, and we want to reduce that stock because substantially, but that's going to take a lot of time. So, you know, we can build carbon sequestration methods. Uh, the picture here is of kelp forests, which help to absorb a lot of carbon. So some scientists might argue that those are quite taxed right now, that they themselves as stock are quite full of carbon. And so trying to get carbon out of the atmosphere is going to take a long time. So where stocks are good and say maintaining a stock that uh, we want, such as water, they can also be slow and, you know, bothersome, such as the stock of our atmosphere storing carbon. It's going to take a long time to drain that, if you will. And so I think, yep, this is my last slide here. All right, so controlling stocks. <clears throat> think about F, inflow minus outflow. Pretty, it's who controls the stock that has a lot of power on the overall system. And so you, know, you have a lot of conversations and regulations and rules and policies about how much of something we have. Multiple flows uh, may control even harder. Um, diversification, so this is really interesting. For instance, you know, if you have one job and you have one source of where income comes from for you and your family, and you lose that job, that means all monetary income stops. But it's really easy to just have, say, one job. I wanna say, you know, maybe your job's hard, but it's easy to just show up for one job. Whereas if you work three or four part-time jobs, you know, and you lose one of them, at least you have other jobs and other income is taking place. But it's really hard to manage three or four jobs at one point in time. But if something happens to one, at least you got the others. So this idea of ease of difficulty, but diversification of flows. Um, to increase stock, uh, is it easier to increase inflow or decrease outflow? So, you know, if you want to have power, do you have it up front? For instance, you know, buying more energy, or is it easier to make your house more energy efficient? That's for you to decide. Rates will often change, but what is, uh, but what is greater is most important. So basically, are we having a lot of something or a little bit of something, or is there a lot of outflow or a little bit of outflow? Like whatever variable, auxiliary variable is greater, that one needs to command your attention. You need to pay attention to the one that has most influence. There's no sense spending a lot of time on an inflow if that's 
small and your outflow is great. Pay attention to the one that's having greater behavior change on your stock. Controlling the dynamic of stock requires taking into account all of a stock flows simultaneously. To be ignorant, if you will, of, say if you're so focused on inflows and to be oblivious or ignorant if, of an outflow, it's just like leaks in your house, for instance, or leaks in a sink, uh, or leaks in your faucet over time. Like, and then that might show up in your water bill if you are neglecting a faucet leak. Um, you know, being mindful of both over time. At least identifying, okay, this one's less, I don't need to pay as much attention to it now. The inflow is greater, I will pay attention to it. You know, those can change. And so being aware of all, not just one, but say all of your inflows or outflows is important. Uh, more stock can reinforce stock of growth. Um, interest rates are a great example of this. Um, you know, if you have a greater if you have a higher interest rate, and the more money you put into something that has interest rate, it'll generate more. Stock encourages more stock, uh, but also carbon does the exact same thing in temperature. More carbon in the atmosphere increases that temperature more so. And my last one is that. Balancing can happen as a stock approaches its goal or limit. Uh, slows down as the, there's a discrepancy decrease. So if the brim of your tub is, is here, or the brim of your reservoir is here, and your stock is here, it might want to meet that, meet that, but then as it starts to approach, it'll slow down. So hope most systems, naturally speaking, once they hit capacity, they stop. There's something that's kind of odd at play if there's a tendency to want to go above it either that the environmental conditions are too severe and pushes it, or there's a non-desirable behavior at play and it goes beyond capacity. And so, um, you know, I think the, the US obesity epidemic is a great example, that there's too much food readily accessible and the, what the type of food it is, that that is not regular in terms of natural things. And then our bodies pay the consequence of going beyond this idea of our, what are we naturally handle and then what we are actually handling. So as you explore the stuff and the amount of stuff that you want or don't want, stocks and flows uh, are incredibly important to understand and how much time you have in order to increase or decrease the amount that you want. Thanks.